Welcome to the DFO Rundown Podcast with Frank Saravalli and Jason Greger on dailyfaceoff.com. Delivered by DoorDash. Welcome to episode 87, the Crosby edition of the DFO Rundown. I'm Jason Greger alongside uh, Frank Saravalli. Uh, Frank, back from uh, Florida, add a little color. I don't know if you got to golf. No color. Or yeah, not. No, no color, color right? no golf, no, no fun, nothing. Jeez, and by the way, this isn't the Sydney Crosby. Everyone knows that this is really the Donald Brashear episode oh, yes. of the DFO Rundown. Oh, Dude, Donald Brashear, man. A guy who early in his career was somebody who held on, and then he just became an absolute killer later in his career. Oh, could he crush guys? Mm-hmm. Yeah, big, strong man, uh, Donald Brashear. <laughs> um, Frank, let's start with, um, well, because you're in Florida, let's finish off with that. We're going to get into the uh, the Canucks today. Uh, we're going to talk some Islanders. I think we have to talk Ovechkin, too. Are you freaking kidding me? There's like Crosby, McDavid, and Ovechkin, and then there's a big gap. I don't know. Like, Ovi, this is unreal. We're probably not even talking about him enough. Uh, we'll get to some teams that we think are out of it and really don't have ways to fix it. So uh, lots of fun coming up today on the episode. But let's start with the Board of Governors and what you've learned since in regards to the Olympics, because that's obviously a huge, huge topic and situation right now. Yeah, last time we spoke on Friday, uh, didn't have as you know complete of a picture as we do now. Now having a sense from the IOC that it's looking like somewhere between a three to five and I'm say five. And there's like nine exclamation points attached to that week quarantine. I mean, could you imagine, you know, I can't imagine two weeks inside a Chinese isolation facility, let alone the idea of five. Um, It's these rules that are put in place and these restrictions and regulations are, are simply not friendly for the NHL and its players to go. And so, you know, now that the NHL and NHL PA have this information, the process is, is beginning where the PA is beginning to poll players and, and, and canvas them and say, look, now you know what the regulations are. Are you still willing to go? Because I think there were a lot of guys previously and quietly that were saying, Hey, you know, I, I have concerns about going, but as I said on the pod on Friday, it, it's one thing to be concerned. It's another thing to be raising your hand saying, I'm not going. Yes. So that's sort of where they're at at the moment. I, I do think that players, a lot of them are steadfast in their desire to go, but I, I don't know how in good faith, you know, the NHL PA could possibly say that this potential quarantine and look, we can talk and get into the weeds about, you know, maybe these guys are really unlikely to test positive there, given that it's a closed loop bubble type scenario and everyone's fully vaccinated and there's not going to be a lot of outside interaction and really actually none once yeah. you get there. Mm-hmm. But I think this is untenable for players and then to bring it back to the NHL and, and their business. I don't know how they can possibly go given the way that this is structured at the moment, maybe there's some breakthrough that comes along where, you know, they say if if you test positive, you can somehow find a way to get chartered out or or evacuated, but the players have a lot on the line here and it's not just the quarantine period. It's also financial because for one, any time missed due to the Olympics and, and potentially testing positive, you you miss pay on the back end of that. If you're stuck in China and the league resumes, your team can suspend you without pay. Oh yeah, but do you think they would? I, I honestly, I think that they would. At, given this juncture and what we know now, yes, you knew okay. going in what the risks were, and and not only that, but also what happens if it's a vast majority of players, you know, 60, 80, 100 players that test positive and are stuck there you have to cancel games. And so all of a sudden you're taking canceled games and you're deducting that from HRR, which brings a different financial hit to players, you know, maybe not immediately seen in their paychecks, but certainly in the overall pie of revenue, uh, it becomes smaller. So I, I think this is pretty, pretty critical in terms of a development that this Olympics was sort of on, uh, on a rocky road 
you know, where they've been, but it's, it's gotten significantly rockier and it's, it's hard to envision a path forward at the moment for players to go. What I would find fascinating is what does the schedule maker do if there's no Olympics? Because now you've had all this time off. Do you then reschedule all the games? Do you give everybody just, you know, they like can. six days off? Because that to me is, you don't, you don't want to have a break and not have, and like, I get why you have the break because your best players at the Olympics, but if they're not at the Olympics, and I know that we, we, Frank, we had a few people even uh, send us some tweets uh, a daily face off about, oh, you know, could they just do a spur of the moment uh, World Cup? I was told that that would be very difficult to do, right? They, they flat out shoot. said at the Board of Governors meeting that's yeah. not possible and they're yeah, not so doing it. It's, so. it's so, not not happening. But, but here's to, to answer your, I actually have the answer to your question. Um, they're in a really tough spot because, you know, think back to the pandemic and it wasn't just sports that were canceled. It was concerts, family shows, the circus, all these different touring acts that didn't get a chance to, to hit their normal circuit of venues. Well, the NHL had a three week break in their schedule. And as much as they had told teams, Hey, hold off, you know, this is, you know, tentative. A lot of them went ahead and booked dates for their buildings and, and reasonably so like if you have an empty building, why let it sit vacant when you could be making money. And so there the, the number of available dates has shrunk significantly. So uh, I'm told that we'd likely still be looking at a 10 day to two week break and then perhaps come back one week earlier um, and also use that window to reschedule games that have been postponed. But otherwise, uh, it seems like players are still going to have at least a, a 10 day break where they can, you know, sort of, you know, relax a bit and and maybe go on that vacation that was planned. Well, you know what, Frank, the, if there if that happens. To me, that's actually quite a big positive when you look at the at the skill level of the NHL and the product. Because if every player in the NHL, because I know it's the best guys, they're all going to the Olympics. And so they don't really get a break. And, and even though I know it's only four, five, seven games, depending on where you play, but it's also the travel and everything else. If every player in the league had a 10-day break, Frank, you come back, everybody's refreshed, or you know, they just they're a little bit healthier. That could make the games a lot more uh, exciting coming late February and into March. Yeah, maybe go on a 10-day break, uh, you know, wherever you want to go, Hawaii, the Caribbean, and you come back, feel a little guilty and and play better. Um, honestly, it's it would be fascinating because in a normal Olympic year, you know, there's such a condensed sort of stretch run but because this season started a couple weeks later than normal and it is the regular season extends through late April, you'd actually have a pretty significant chunk of hockey that's being played late in the season with refreshed players, to your point, that could make it really good. Well, and the other challenge I was told from speaking to someone from Hockey Canada is, so let's say the NHL decides at the last minute they're not going. Well, these countries still want to get people in there, but now you have the drug testing issue where you would have to put like you know maybe it'd be a lot of the guys from the 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 canadian spengler cup team for instance right and and other players like that now i'm not saying any of them wouldn't wouldn't pass it but the ioc is pretty strict on that you really had to you could barely even get anybody who wasn't on your 50-man roster in so now you're going to have all these new teams that's just another wrinkle that goes into this and uh, it's fascinating to me to see and the one thing that they, so they've actually had those players on the list to be tested. Just so you know, it, it's the the NHL long list of 55. Yeah. And then you could have another 100 players for a total of, I think, 150 that you have on your, your list um, that were subject to testing the entire time. So, uh, you know, the thought from Hockey Canada is that it would largely be the players from the Spengler Cup team. That's, you know, sort of what they're building that roster around in the meantime, just in case. But that's actually something that the NHL and the PA are keeping in mind. Everyone's so focused on this January 10th deadline. And it it is a deadline, but it also isn't. For one, the financial penalty isn't, you know, absolutely insane. I'm told it's somewhere between a million and two million dollars. And of course, that's not money that anyone wants to just throw away. But if they need to go beyond that to make a decision, I think they would. But the other part on the back end of that is with all the respect that they have for USA Hockey, Hockey Canada, all these federations, 
They don't want to stick them at the last minute and say, hey, it's January 27th. And oh, by the way, the Olympics start in 10 days. You need to get your roster together and get all those players and the logistics to China. So it wouldn't be easy. And I think they're keeping that in mind as well. But if the players, enough of them raise their hand in the next two weeks, there's no reason you have to go to January 10th to make a decision. If they have, are armed with enough information that enough players don't want to go, they could actually theoretically make a decision before Christmas not to go. Hmm. It'll be a, It'll be interesting. I know fans are disappointed and I, I think players, everybody, they wanted to see best on best. It hasn't happened. I know we had the World Cup, but it was a little bit different. And uh, Olympics is just, you know, it's not just hockey. It's, you know, it's a massive sporting event and hasn't happened since 2014, at least with the best players. So hopefully uh, they figure it out and uh, there, there's some sort of compromise of common sense because five weeks just seems ridiculous. What would you do? If I was a player? Yeah. Man. You know what, Frank? I... I'm all, everybody's double vaxxed. You're staying in that bubble. Like you look at, at how few guys on their teams got it the last time. Like, and that's when guys weren't even vaccinated, right? Now everybody's vaccinated. I think the odds of getting it are extremely low. I, you know, you, you have certain times in your life. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. I would go. I think at last count, I saw 114 players this season have, have been in the COVID protocol. Yeah, now, not all of public. Right. Yeah. Not all of them are positive tests. Some of those are yes. close contacts, but still in the protocol, nonetheless, which is a pretty significant chunk of players, like a little more than 15%. Plus, uh, plus the other guys, Frank, who already had it last year or in the off season. And now those guys are all vaccinated. Plus you, when you take the vaccination and then having um, had COVID, you, your, your immune system is supposed to be even higher, right? When the combination of both that, right, but I'm saying this, that that's all... this year, that's yeah. all that's there. And they're all double vax, yeah. but 15% have, have been in the protocol, which is still a pretty, you know, if you said to me, you have a 10% chance or 15%, it's, it's whatever the point is, it's more than a 0% chance that you test positive and that's the difficulty. So uh, now let me pose you this question. What would you do, not a player, what would you do if you were a media member? Would nah, you, nah. you, would you it's go? Not, um, see, it's different because the, the media members from one, I, now, unless I'm, I'm wrong. So I'm, this, I'm supposed to go Yeah, and I'm, now, I'm scheduled to go, but I am personally saying to myself, do I really want to spend three to five weeks in Chinese isolation if I test positive? Are you in the bubble? Yes. Oh. Hmm. So I'm saying to myself, what am I getting myself into? Yeah, see, and honestly, this is the conversation I'm having with myself. Obviously, I don't have a chance to play for a medal. First off, look at me. I'm not, I don't have a chance to play for a men's league medal. Um, like, it's different. I'd say no. You would say no. Okay. Yeah, because to me, um, as, as, a, as a media guy, your opportunities, you can cover 10 Olympics. That's just a fact, right? Lots of guys, there's no age limit on that. There's, there's right. a short window of age opportunities for players to be elite level. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm with you. I think that makes sense. Yeah. But I, I, I'm, I'm still kind of leaning towards going. My thing, and you know, maybe not more for the pod, but my thing is, you know, I can sell my wife on a three-week trip to China, but all of a sudden if it becomes six or yeah. eight weeks, then oh, all yeah. of a sudden it's like, well, what, am, what are we signing ourselves up for here? Yeah, it's... It is at the same time when I talk about a once in a lifetime experience, that is still a once in a lifetime experience because no other future Olympic hopefully will be in the same situation like that. You know what I mean? So it, yeah. that in itself could be. A and it's a also, and it's China. Like had this been played in, I don't know, Norway. Like, I don't know that we're having the same conversation. Yeah. See, I'll, I'll admit like I've traveled a lot. China's on my places of least interested in wanting to go. It's just too busy. I actually really want to go to China at okay. some point, but I don't want to do it in a pandemic. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, let's get to the uh, Vancouver Canucks. Uh, we haven't talked about Jim Rutherford. Of course, that mm -hmm. happened after our last pod. He's now the president. He's looking for a GM, Frank. And, and it's interesting because we had Bill Guerin on the pod uh, uh, last, well, earlier this year. And he talked openly about how much he learned from Jim. And, and we've seen it. Like, Bill's been very aggressive in Minnesota, and it's paid off. Like, if, if you're a, a prospective GM, like if I'm the Vancouver Canucks, I don't think I want a real experienced GM. I've got a guy who's done. I want someone that can help groom a guy who can be, because I think 
you know, I, I know that this might sound hypocritical because Jim Rutherford is somewhat of a retread, but he's a successful one. And mm -hmm. he's someone with a track record of helping the young guys work their way up. I think he'd be a great mentor. And I would want to hire a guy who could learn under Jim, who's never been a GM before. And I think there's long-term benefits of that. Well, I think my biggest question is how much experience does Jim Rutherford want in terms of that person as well? Yeah, because he's never really, that's, that's kind of the big thing is, you know, you heard Francesco Aquilini say in his press conference, the key is getting someone that has, has a great relationship is in lockstep with, you know, between president and GM. And that's hard to find. Mm -hmm. And also Jim Rutherford's never done this. He's always been the guy with two hands on the wheel and control over everything. How much of that control is he willing to give up? Does he want final say? Does he want to be the one who who's making the calls around? Like, that's the big question. If you are the general manager, you know, you're the general manager of the New Jersey devils, Tom Fitzgerald, and you want to make a trade with the Vancouver Canucks, who are you calling? Is it Jim Rutherford or is it the new guy? I think that's a really key question to answer here. And it also kind of will give you insight into how this will work in the future. Uh, and, and I, you know, I just don't see Jim Rutherford, given how aggressive he is, given how active he is, given how many times he's reinvented himself um, over the course of his career. Everyone thought he was done leaving Carolina, goes to Pittsburgh and, and wins two more Stanley Cups um, and earns a place, a rightful place in the Hockey Hall of Fame. So he, he's done all those things he's shown the ability to mentor. Is this another mentor situation where he's still in control or will this person that's the GM have more of a say? It seems eerily similar potentially to the Montreal Canadiens and, and how they're structured. But for different reasons. Yes. But how their structure is going to be built. Right. Yes. And who knows if it, it'll work or not, but I, I, I think, you know, it's a great question. Who does he, maybe he calls the GM first. But ultimately, that GM then, after conversations, you know, talks to uh, kind of like, you know what, uh, Frank, you ever go buy a car, right? You're dealing with your sales guy and everything's, oh, I got to go talk to my manager. Right now, sometimes that's just a joke waste thing. But I was going to say, how annoying of a process is that? And if you're the be. GM, does the do you never, when you buy a car, you never see the manager then walk over to you and cut the deal. It's this constant game of back and forth with the guy in the office. Do you know how annoying that would be for these other GMs to be like, oh, let me get back to you. I got like, oh, let me call you back. Let me call you back. Like it would go on forever. Yeah. Or maybe at what know, point does Jim Rutherford just get on the phone and say, I'll just do this deal myself. What do I need you for? Yeah, that's fair. Right. And, or it's one where they have the conversation first after one convo to say, okay, here's what I think. Right. This is what our recommendation is. Now I'll let you be the guy you go talk. You know what we want. Right. It's almost like he, the GM would be the filter. Like, yes. you know, and sort he, of sifting out the bullshit calls that you get, the the, yes. the the tire kickers that are fishing around, and he only comes in when it's time to actually talk turkey. He'll go to the GM meetings and the other things that sometimes you have to do. And, and but, there, be but here's the thing is you're dealing with long-term relationships here that Jim Rutherford already has with so many of these managers. Yeah. Like, it's hard to just sidestep that and say, you know what? That's that level is sort of below me now, and and you need to direct all your calls to, I don't know, Patrick Alvine or whoever you hire in Vancouver. Do you think the ownership group can stay at arm's length? Uh, that to me is the ultimate question for the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, to this point, in the fifteen years that we've seen, I believe it's 15, I think it's 2008, it might be 2005, whatever the number is, 15, 18 years, that we've seen the Aquilini family operate the Vancouver Canucks. I don't know that they have been at arm's length. And I think that's the real question is how much autonomy exists here. And, you know, can Jim Rutherford and whoever he hires come in and do exactly what they need to do? Because if they can, I don't really have any doubt that they can be successful given Jim Rutherford's track record and given, you know, the fact that he has a blank slate in terms of the front office that he can hire. You saw they, they cleaned house with some other positions as well. You know, you've got your, 
not just the general manager position opening, you've got your assistant general manager jobs, you've got your salary cap job. All those jobs are open for Jim Rutherford to bring in people of consequence that can help. Not only that, they're not starting with an empty cupboard. You know, I, I've said it before, I actually like the pieces that the Vancouver Canucks have. And on paper, that team should have been better than yes. they are this season. So you're not starting with nothing. You have something to build around. And if you have an ownership group that's not breathing down your neck and putting heat on you all the time, well, then why can't they turn it around? Well, they, they need some better defensemen. Like to me, they're, they're, they're the right side. That's a big, that's a big issue that mm -hmm. they, and it's hard. Like teams have spent years trying to find good right defensemen. And I think that's, that's going to be their biggest challenge uh, for, for uh, who's ever the, you know, whether it's uh, Rutherford, their new GM, whoever it's going to be is, can they solidify and build up their defense? Like Quinn Hughes is an outstanding defenseman, right? I have mm -hmm. no issues with Quinn Hughes. I don't even like Oliver Ekman Larson's played fine. Like they've got some pieces in there, but they just, they need more like Tucker Pullman's not a top pair guy. Hamannick's not a top pair guy. And that's any team. When you ask players to play above what they're capable of for long stretches, that's when you have troubles. Guys can do it for 10 games, maybe 15, maybe 20. Then it becomes an issue. And I think that's, the, that's got to be priority number one. Like Demko, they got Demko. You got Horvat and Pedersen down the middle. You know, they got to figure out what they'll do with Brock Besser. They've got some other guys I like, but they got to solidify the right side. Well, I mean, here's the thing, and maybe the one sort of black mark on, on Jim Rutherford's tenure in Pittsburgh and sort of the way that he left things is that I don't know that everyone unanimously agrees with the, some of the choices that he made building that Penguins defense, like it, you know, and also particularly some of the contracts that were given out, um, you know, trading for Mike Matheson's deal is one thing, um, you know, just trying to shake things up and do it a little bit differently, but the long-term deal that Marcus Pedersen got, um, you know, the long-term deal that John Marino got, um, you know, I don't know that everyone looks at that Penguins decor and says, yeah, that, you know, he exactly bathed himself in glory there. True. But he also built the decor that won two without Chris Letang one year, right? Yes. Picked up Ron Hainsey and Ron Hainsey was unbelievable. Now, some would say that's a little bit of luck, whatever, but, uh, you know, it worked out. So, you know, it's, it's hard for GMs. I to have every move and be good year after year after year. But the thing I love about Rutherford, Frank, that I was so happy to see him back in, no one trades more than Jim. So, and you know what? Bill Guerin's made a lot of moves, some really bold ones, the buyouts, of course, none more bold than that. And, and it's good to have a guy like that in the league who's not afraid. To, now, maybe some people say, well, look at all the trades. They were insignificant. But he's not afraid to do something rather than some guys who just sit there and never make a trade because they're scared to. Yeah. Well, you know, I... I agree wholeheartedly and I love how aggressive he is. By the way, I, I do want to, you know, pick one uh, bone of contention with you. The guy that actually, if you look historically, that trades more than Jim Rutherford, and I don't know that people recognize it, is David Poyle. He actually typically trades more and more often than Jim Rutherford in his career. Um, but you know what I love most about Jim Rutherford is he makes a lot of moves but he's not afraid to pull the plug or pull the, pull the shoot when it doesn't work out. Yes. yes. You trade for a guy or you sign a guy and it's no good. He doesn't wait that long to say, Oh man, you know, I, I, I made a mistake and I, I'm afraid of what ownership might think of, of, you know, if I'm suddenly moving this guy again, like even if it's at a loss, He's willing to cut his losses and just say, let's cut bait and get out of here because it doesn't make sense to hang on to this any longer than I need to. And you look at the way that he, you know, in those cup years specifically reshaped that defense core on the fly because of some initial moves that he made that didn't work out. That is the true mark of, of a GM who's aggressive is to say, I tried it and it didn't work and now I'm going to do something different. Frank Saravalli, Jason Greger with you on the DFO Rundown. Frank, I want to get to two individual players for two very different reasons. I want to talk about a guy that, and it seems crazy to say, well, we probably haven't talked about him enough because, you know, what he's doing this year and what he's poised to do potentially in the next few coming seasons. But Alexander Ovechkin 
It's 28 games. I think many people felt like, okay, Ovi's going to slow down. And now his goal scoring, because he was almost a goal a game guy, he's still got 20 goals in 28 games. He's got 24 assists. Ovi rarely has more assists than goals. He has filled Nick Backstrom's being gone, and Ovi just decides this late in his career that suddenly he's going to be the disher. He's got 24. There's That's Bryce what's been Edelman, most David, impressive. They have 45 points, and Ovechkin has 44. Like right now today, he'd be the Hart Trophy winner. Uh, well, he probably would be because McDavid and Dreisaitl would split a lot of votes. Yeah. But he, I think but by that, the term- that's going to be the other part to re- that's really interesting is I think the last time we've really had this type of scenario, if I'm not mistaken, was 96. 2001 when, if you look at the Hart Trophy voting, Joe Sackick ended up winning. Over and the, Mario and Yager? The reason for that was... Mario and Yager were on the same team, as you said, and ended up splitting the vote. And Joe Sackick sort of waltzed right in and, and won pretty handily. Yeah. Well, it's uh, and it's true. They, they could cancel each other out, which, you know, but it's just the fact that what he's doing at this age, Frank, like it and, and it is doing something he's never really done. He's never been a playmaker like ever. So I, I don't know if this counts as a hot take, but I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, Ovi does not win the Rocket Richard this year. Yeah, I could see that. I think Austin Matthews is winning it. You think he's going to catch dry saddle? Yep. All right. Um, if you look at, I mean, Ovi has slowed down a little bit, and I, I know that you can't just continue to play at that clip all year and score at that clip. But Ovi has one in his last six. Dreisaitl has slowed down a little bit. And all of a sudden, Matthews is right there. Uh, he's five back of Dreisaitl. Like, he was like 13 back at one point or 14 back. And he's he's basically made up that ground. And we still have 50-some games to play. Yeah, no, I just I think I just wanted to give a shout out to Ovi because of what he's doing still it's 28 games and he's one point behind McDavid and Drysaddle. Those guys are like a decade younger than him. It's it's crazy. Um, so Ovi has one in his last six and Drysaddle has three in his last seven. So yeah. but Matthews has just been on a ridiculous run. Yeah. So and uh, I'm sure that'll quiet, you know, quiet down too, but you could make the argument that Matthews had his dry spell to start the season and may not cool down again. Yeah, no, Matthews, uh, you know, uh, Leon dry settle, uh, Kyle Connor, very quietly is a, is a guy who scores goals quite well, maybe not quietly, but, uh, well, he does, awesome. you know, we actually don't talk about Kyle Connor yeah. in the elite of the elite in terms of not just goal scorers, but players in this league. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, he's quietly very good. Just goes about his business. Uh, another U S Olympian. Yeah. If the NHL players end up going, by the way, heard some interesting um, USA roster talk. There seems to be some thought that Brady Kachuk is on the outside looking in at a spot for team USA. What? Interesting. Yep. I don't, and I wouldn't bet on that. First off, I wouldn't bet on the NHL players going to the Olympics anyway. Okay. I, I ultimately think Brady Kachuk makes it, but I, I can tell you that I, there's been some conversation on that front. Now, I, I want to get your thoughts on um, another guy, Frank, who in the last two weeks, and, and, I, and I can't take credit for this. I'm t- completely stealing this from the New York Rangers Twitter because they tweeted it out on Sunday night and absolutely loved it. Well, at it. least you're honest. They called it the uh, the true, true train as uh, Jacob True True has, uh, uh, Truba, excuse me, has been getting everybody in the trolley tracks. And, you know, he had the two big hits. You know, I, I know it's unfortunate what happened to a, to a, to Jujar Kera, of course. Uh, and then he had the big hit on McKinnon. And then he caught Luca Kunin from Nashville. Now, very clean. Kunin got right back up. But, man, like right now, I don't think there's a better open ice hitter in the NHL than Jacob Truba. And guys are going to have to start paying attention to him. Like for many years, Frank, there was guys like Alf Samuelson and Brian Marchman. Now, you had to keep your head up because they weren't afraid to stick a knee out every now and then right? But we just don't see open ice hits very often. And I want to give a shout out to Truba because I think it's a lost art and it's a really hard skill to do. Okay. I appreciate your shout out. 
I think this is a worthy topic of conversation. But I think that at two of those hits are predatory. Remember last week we had we had fill in the blank and it was describe Jacob Truba's hits with one word predatory. Clean, yes, by the rule book. But we've seen a couple players sent to the hospital, and you're going, you know, I think back to the Mike Richards, David Booth hit. And that sort of, you know, not to say we're at the same precipice here, but that changed the way that the game was called and looked at in terms of hits. And it was because David Booth was stretchered off and sent to the hospital. And there was nothing that the NHL could pick at in that hit based on their rule book to suspend Mike Richards when everyone looked at it and said, oh, this is a little bit gross. I don't like the way that this feels or looks. I wonder if we're getting close to the similar type conversation. Like the principal point of contact in these hits and, and, you know, the one from, from Sunday uh, on Luke Cunning was just, you know, I, I, I have no issue with that at all. Um, like none whatsoever, but do we need to have a larger conversation? And I hate the way that that even comes off as like me being soft or something like that. I, I just think in terms of the long-term health of the game and the players, I wonder if we need to be having that conversation. It's an interesting one to, to bring up. And, and I think if we can do it with, you know, calm, it's totally fine. I, I look at Truba and like the McKinnon one, especially McKinnon, just at the last second, put his head down. Truba was already coming. He's tracking. I'm not, I'm not sure like, like the game is so fast that and when they play the replay they always play it in slow motion which just irks me because it makes it oh look at how much time he had well no that's that's not real and um you know when a guy puts his head down i'm not blaming the victim at all but at the same time if if you keep your elbows in and your shoulders down and and and, and it is as we all said clean are we saying a guy can't try to step on up on guys to force them to be like hey i gotta have my head on a swizzle when troop is on the ice now Right. It's you're right, Frank. It's a good conversation because it's like, I don't know which one is is better or worse because I think we want contact in the game. I just don't like either hit, either McKinnon or it's really the Jujar Carroll one that really bothers me. I wonder me. if Jujar's past concussions, because I've I've had many concussion experts on my show, and they say once you have one, it's easier. And then he had two. It's right? not him two. being knocked out, it's the fact that inherently by the nature of this game, you have to look down at certain points. As much as we want to say that the onus is on the puck carrier, it's, a, it's an undeniable physical necessity to have to look down to see where the puck is. Should yeah. that player automatically be vulnerable all the time? That's, it's a, that's, that's, a that's really the crux of the question, and I don't know the answer to it, but I would say that there probably should be a little grace period. And I don't know how you call that or officiate it because it's insanely difficult. But I don't know that Jujar Kara or Nathan McKinnon in that situation should have had their head taken off for what is a routine play that, you know, wasn't this wasn't sort of Eric Lindros of 1999 and 2000 you know, skating through the neutral zone with your head down. Yeah, and that's fair. And then the next question is going to be, if Jacob Trouba is really the only guy delivering these type of hits, is it something you have to have a big, like we don't need to go Matt Duchesne overboard on an offside here, right? Maybe it's just like, hey guys, there's got to be a message. Jacob Trouba, when he's on the ice, you got to be more aware. Well, that, that, that can't be the way that it works though. It can't just be like, hey, Trouba's out there, keep your head up. It's like, how do we better protect the players no matter who's out there? That's but what I, I think, think the they, conversation yeah, is. Yeah, I think. And, and before I get all the tweets from everyone, like, oh, you snowflake, you know, you, you're soft. You want to take it. I, I just think we, we've reached that point to have the conversation. Yeah, no. And I think it's fair to have the conversation if, because the thing is like, it's a skill set that most guys can't even do. Like there's just not that many hits now. Right. So right. I guess you could say, okay, we're, but I don't even know how do you go about what wording do you put in place here? To I, I don't know how I, I, that's my, my issue is I don't know how you do it. Yeah. 
Because like what if their heads the goal up? of a hit has always been to separate player from puck, right? Yeah. I, when I look at those two hits on McKinnon and on especially on Kara, like those aren't to separate the player from the puck. That was to run the guy over. Well, the Kara one definitely was a little bit farther. McKinnon, I thought, was just so bang bang. Like, um, but you're it's it's an interesting one because how like how do we it's hard enough to officiate the game. But like he he travels 15, 20 feet just to make the hit. Like, is it bang bang? Like, I, I don't know. And again, I'm not saying it's dirty. I think there's a difference between dirty and predatory. And in this case, I think this was predatory. Specifically with McKinnon and, and Kara. I don't have really any issue at all with the one on on Cunning. Yeah, Frank, it's a good conversation, man. And it's one that uh uh, you know, they'll probably maybe have at the next uh, GM meetings or board of governors meeting. Obviously, it's something that's going to be in the off season. And I, I just have a pit in my stomach watching it. Like, I really hope Jujar Kara thinks long and hard about coming back. Yeah, that's fair. Right. It's I mean, that. so that's three now that he's been out cold. Yeah. At what, what point are we going like, what are you doing here? Yeah. Uh, I understand the the willingness to want to come back. You're a highly competitive person. I get that. I also understand the side that says, hey, is it worth it to have the long-term effects later in life? So yeah, it's that's a tough decision that's up to the individual. And I'm sure he'll have his loved ones close to him and doctors talking to him about it. But yeah, I'd be surprised if he plays again this year. I'll say that. He's made $5 million in his career. He has another $1 million coming to him. Like, man, you're such a young guy, 27. Like, go out and enjoy your life. You like yeah. you don't want to be a vegetable at fifty. No, yeah, no, it's it's definitely a, a fair conversation for sure and a fair observation. Um, uh, a few other things, Frank, to uh, to get to um, on the show. We'll get to quick hits in, in a second. Brought to you by uh, DoorDash. Tyler's not here today, so I don't know if I can have the same ding dong, but we'll try <laughs> uh, a little bit later on. Uh, we had a few people asking. Um, we had Dallas Aikens on the show, which was very well received. Um, from a what lot about of the they... timing of that? Oh. You, you know, J- Dallas Aikens and what he said compared to Torts and what he said. Like, put the two of those videos side by side. Which coach is going to be coaching longer in the NHL? Yeah, like I – and hey, you know what? I respect John. He's entitled to his opinion. A part of me wonders how much of that is I want to say the opposite because we get people talking because I know that's, that's – And that's me. why I didn't – have like i i was certainly critical in my tweet if you saw it on friday night but how much of this is a shtick is this is the same network that employs screaming a smith and you know they they trot him out on the daily to say ridiculous things for for clicks and views yes but at the same time if and I, I would actually say that since he continued to double down on it in the post game show and i'm not sure if you saw the clip if this is exactly what John Tortorella thinks, I don't know how he could ever get another job in the NHL again. Yeah. Well, see, and Frank, how could any young out. player watching that clip, Jason, yeah, w- listening to what he says, ever think that John Tortorella is going to trust you to be creative on the ice? Yeah, it didn't like the point when he said I would have a conversation with him. I would strongly disagree with that. I think it'd be ridiculous okay, he's the coach. The part that I really, I was like, John, you can't honestly believe that that's true. The claim that this is losing fans. Are you joking? He said, he said, is this good for our game? Yeah. It's the exact opposite. Your game. First of all, it's not John's game. It's not Frank's game. It's not anybody's game. It's the game of hockey. And here's the thing that I don't really understand. We have seen guys on two on ones come down the one wing, Frank, the defenseman lays down on the ice. You float it over it. And sometimes a guy bats it out of midair. What the hell's the difference? Just because he floated it over the net and we haven't seen it before. Like I just give me a break to suggest if anything, you had weight. Did you see all the videos of kids you know what's trying? good for our game? John Tortorella trying to fight another coach in the hallway. That's really good for our game. <laughs> I mean, Ugh. honestly, what like why why are like I, I first off, I don't understand why he has a platform, to be honest. And I get that he's won a Stanley Cup, but like it, it's like I don't understand the line of thinking that he continually has time after time. Um, I, I just, when I, when I look at that and, and by the way, that was actually brought up as a positive et, like point of emphasis in the board of governors meeting on Friday, 
50 yeah. million views on social media. Yes. Like the owners loved it. If you want to talk should. about good for the game, ESPN loved it. And I can tell you, I coached uh, two games this weekend for our eight and under team. Uh, our game today was in Wilkes-Barre at the practice facility of the uh, AHL Penguins. And there was a player in our 8U game that actually tried it from behind the net, flipped the puck out, got it over the net to the middle. I looked yeah. at, at my other coach. I was like, hey, like he actually just tried the yes. Zegras. Good for him. In our game. Eight As and eight year olds. Yes. Yeah. But that's bad. Uh, but it's not, yeah, not, not good for the game. No. It's yeah. Like, like give me a break. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, Frank, we're going to get to uh, quick hits now, brought to you by DoorDash. Ding dong. You can use the uh, rundown uh, promo code, uh, rundown DD, and that'll get you 25% off your order for first time orders. Check it out at DoorDash. And so, quick hits, Frank. Islanders, Flyers, same division, virtually in the same position. And I'm not sure either one has a lot of tradable assets. What do they do? Uh, I think the Flyers have tradable assets. Um, I'm not, I don't think there are as many on the Islanders, but like if the Flyers decided that they wanted to move on from Travis Konechny to shake things up, I think there would be someone that's really interested. Um, I think James Van Riemsdyk, as tough of a season as he's had, if you're willing to eat half, uh, knowing his track record of essentially kind of being that 25, 28, 30 goal guy, pretty consistently you could find someone. Claude Giroux, it, it, um, I think, would certainly be in demand at the deadline. And keep an eye on him because this is the last year of his deal. Yes. Uh, they have not talked. They purposely tabled talks. And I think Claude Giroux wants to get through 1,000 games in a Flyers uniform um, which you don't see all that often to play all 1000 with one team. He hits that in early March before the trade deadline, if he stays healthy. So, you know, maybe he hits that kind of milestone and then becomes available, even though his cap hits high, he's been, you know, the flyers, arguably their best player. So 23 points in 26 games, there'd be a lot of interest and, I don't think he's available, but I think that at some point there was talk that he might be Ivan Provorov. I, I, man, he, that guy is so up and down all over the place. You know, sometimes he looks really good and you're thinking this guy's in number one and, and, and can really do it. And then at other times you're like, Oh, I, I really wish there'd be a more complete view on, on Provorov in terms of the support around him. Um, you know, to better sort of evaluate where he's at in his progression and his career. Oh, man, if the Philadelphia Flyers trade him, I'm telling you, that'll be one they regret. I'm a huge pro Roth fan dating back to his time in the WHL. I watched him close for so many years. He was the best player in that league a few years, just absolutely dominant. I think he's a really good player. Um, maybe try the Flyers to need to right? trade like, like right now. Um, Keith Yandel. Yeah, he's not helping him at all dash for, you know, you, you know, you think back to that, that game, the two games in a row where they allowed uh, seven he, out of the 14 goals, he was on the ice for six of them. Yeah. Frank, are you at all concerned about your Winnipeg jets? Um, I guess I want to know more about Blake Wheeler and I love that they're my Winnipeg jets. Well, no, are they, just cause you are they, are they your Florida Panthers uh, for this year? Sure. <laughs> um, Let's now, I mean, I'm not overly concerned. I, I, I would like to see more consistency. They started off poorly, went on a significant run and are, are now sort of back in a rut. Uh, I'd like to see, I think Mark Shifley has played his way off the Olympic team. Um, I thought their defense would be a little bit better than it has been 68 goals allowed. Um, but not, like, I, I don't, I don't see any reason. I don't think they're missing the playoffs. If, if that's your question. Okay. No, I just thought of you, you know, it's, they're currently in fifth. They played more games than some of the other teams and, and Nashville just continues to, uh, to play very well. They're highly competitive. Um, so I'm just, I'm kind of like the jets, like they, the I Preds aren't making fifth. the playoffs. Are they? You know what, that man, they've won, they've, they've won five in a row, Frank. They're in second place in that division. I thought the, Pre and what's funny about the Preds is I think I was wrong because I forgot how they battled their asses off last mm -hmm. year to get into the playoffs mm -hmm. after digging a deep hole. UC Saros is legit. Roman Yost is hard. top five defenseman in the NHL. And 
they play hard. They got some, they got a great mix of skill and speed. And then they've got guys like Matt Duchesne. Like, what about Marcus Granlin fighting Frank? What's happening? Him and he sure are going at it. I was like, the Preds right now, uh, I'll give them credit, man. They are being, they've been way better than I thought. I'm going to say it. I think the Preds are making the playoffs. Okay. I, I honestly, I think one team I'm really concerned about is Vegas. Yeah, they like, get Jack Eichel back. I think they're fine. But what does he look like when they get him back? Oh, well, you know what, Frank? Here, I, I here's a good story about Jack Eichel. So, I've heard that Jack Eichel, when, when he was when he was training, he for the last year and a half, his neck was so bad he really didn't have much. Per, he couldn't move his neck left to right very far. So he had to play. It's everything's all tightened up. He's been retraining himself to get his vision back so he can see more. I think Jack Eichel, when he comes back, because he's able now to like, think about trying to play the game where you don't have the vision you want because you mm -hmm. can't turn free motion each way. I think Jack Eichel is going to come back now, you know, conditioning. I have no idea, but I think Jack Eichel is going to be great for Vegas because, you know, he fills a gigantic hole. They don't have a number one center. Um, I'm not saying he's going to come out and be a point and a half a game player, but he's so much better, even at 80% of any center they have that that gives them a boost. Okay. So let's play a little game. I know this was supposed to be quick hits. It's December 13th. Give me your eight playoff teams in the West. Uh, Vegas, Edmonton, Minnesota, Nashville, Colorado. So that's five. Winnipeg, Calgary. St. Louis. So I think there's five from the uh, central. So then it comes down to Anaheim. Oh, wait, Calgary. so wait, wait a second. So out of this, there's six teams in the mix in the central, Minnesota, Colorado, Nashville, St. Louis, Winnipeg, and Dallas. Yeah, I don't Which know team is out? Dallas. Okay. And I know they, they won again on Sunday night. I think the ducks just miss. Huh? Who do you have? I have Calgary, Edmonton, and Vegas from the West. But I'm I say Vegas with an asterisk. Like okay. they've got some ground to make up. Okay. From the Pacific, I should say. And then I've got Minnesota, Colorado, Winnipeg. Dallas and St. Louis. I have Nashville. You have the Preds out. missing. Yes. All right. Okay. So I have Anaheim and you have the Preds. We'll see. Yeah. Hmm. No That's hey, no, no offense, Duck or Preds fans. I think your teams are having a great start. I, I, I honestly, I'm Dallas is really interesting to me because I thought that they were cooked to Thanksgiving and then they they played so well after that and now have sort of come back to earth a little bit with three straight losses. Yeah, it's uh Interesting stuff, Frank. Uh, we pre we've covered a lot uh, of ground. Uh, it'll be an interesting week to see. Um, hey, uh, Matthews and Dreisaitl, maybe a, a battle for the uh, Richard Trophy. We'll see it live in person on uh, Tuesday this week. And by, the, by this time next week, could Alex Ovechkin lead the NHL in points? He's one back of both Dreisaitl and McDavid. Are you but could Austin Matthews lead the league in goals? Yeah, I don't think he's making up five in a week, but we'll see. Be well, Frank. We'll talk to you on Friday. Perfect. That was good. We covered a lot of ground. People are going to love that. Yeah, I thought that was a good pod. Yeah, good stuff, guys. Thanks for listening to the DFO Rundown with Saravali and Gregor. Keep it locked on dailyfaceoff.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode. Delivered by DoorDash.